So in the, the spring of 1992, I got my, my first youth ministry in a little church in Abilene, Texas, and I drove, <clears throat> I drove from Dallas to Abilene every weekend um, and, and served in this little church. And in 1993, uh, in the fall, I actually started preaching uh, every Sunday in this church uh, a, as well. And uh, one of the things that I, I, I'm certainly thankful for that little church and, and allowing them to cut my teeth uh, in, in, the, in the craft of preaching, and I've told you all this before, there was this, um, there was this old couple in, in this church, Lloyd and Wanda, and they were, they were quite a combo because Lloyd was senile and Wanda was blind. So this is how they got from point A to point B. He would drive and not know where in the world he was, and he would tell her where they were by, by Cross Street, and she would then tell him where to turn and where to go. So that's quite dangerous, but Lloyd, uh, in his senility, had four or five statements that, depending on the context, he repeated over and over and over and over. And so every Sunday after I preached, he would come up to me and he would shake my hand and he would say, you keep practicing and one day you'll be a good preacher. <laughs> every Sunday for three stinking years. He said that to me. So hopefully I've gotten a little bit better. But I'm going to tell you, we live in an amazing time in history in that we have access to some of the world's greatest preachers at any given time, uh, whether it be through YouTube or TV or podcasts or even church apps. At any given time, we can, we can just log on and, and, and listen or watch our, our favorite preacher. In fact, I actually have a a folder on my phone that says sermons and it's church apps from some of my favorite preachers that I'm able to just kind of at any point in time watch or listen to a sermon. And, and I would venture to say some of y'all had maybe getting ready this morning, uh, either watched or listened to maybe one of your favorite preachers, that there's somebody that you like to, to kind of lock into. One of the, the, the standbys is Dr. Charles Stanley. And I have to tell you, at one time, I had a, a lady in, in one of the churches that I, I served in. Every Sunday, she would walk up to me, and she would say, did you happen to watch Dr. Stanley this morning? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I'm kind of busy on Sunday mornings, so I, I don't get a chance to watch Dr. Stanley. And she goes, well, let me tell you what he said. And, and basically what she was doing is, uh, is saying, if you were Dr. Stanley, your sermon would have been a whole lot better than what it was. But I appreciate that, and, and I tell you, I love to listen to sermons. When I was a kid, this was the worst part of church to me, but I love to listen to sermons. I love the craft. I, I love just to, to see how people approach the Word of God, and when I get to heaven, there are actually two sermons that I want to Netflix. I don't want to just listen to. I want to see the, the, the theatrical presentation of this according to God. I, I want to listen and, and watch the Sermon on the Mount. I, I believe that that's the best sermon that has ever preached, uh, been preached in the history of history. But I also want to go to the day of Pentecost, which is the, the actual first sermon that was preached in the life of the church, and, and it was by, by Peter. And so this morning, what I, I want to do is I want to do something just a little bit different, a little bit unorthodox, and I want to allow the first sermon of the church to be the, the driving force of, of our sermon today. In fact, I was talking to Jim about this earlier today. I'm just going to let the Word of God be the Word of God, and I'm going to allow that to speak. I'll make some, um, some comment along the way, but I want to look at this, this particular sermon. It's Acts chapter 2, and it's going to start on page 909 and go into 911. But one of the things that I would like to do for our sermon is just allow God's Word to be God's Word. But before I get into the actual sermon part of this, I want to look at the context. Every sermon that has ever been preached has been preached in a specific context. And I want to look at this particular context here today. And we're going to start with, with actually uh, verse 1 uh, of chapter 2. It says, when the day of Pentecost uh, arrived. And now, uh, when we look at this here today, I I'm just going to say Pentecost actually means 50th. 
It's, that's the, the, the term that we're going to use here. And uh, Pentecost happened after a week of weeks from Passover. And here's the beautiful thing about this. Of all of the feasts and festivals, because it was most of the time in June, this was the most attended of all of the Jewish festivals throughout the year. A lot of that was because of weather, because of different things. They were able to travel more easily. So there were more people in Jerusalem than any other time throughout the year. And I think God timed this very, very perfectly. It says they were all together in one place and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Now, again, it wasn't that it was a wind. I think what Luke is trying to do here, he is the author of the book of Acts. He is trying to, in, in, in our limited minds, give us a picture of what happens when the Holy Spirit came upon the church. But then it goes on to say, and divided tongues as of fire. Again, it's not literal fire, but as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Now, last week we talked about how the, the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out, that there's going to be a baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's what's happening right here. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as uh, the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And I think this is an important statement. Every nation under heaven. And, and at, this, the, the, at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Now, I don't know what it was like for the Holy Spirit to come upon them, but the reality is this happened in a room and a multitude gathered around to come to see what happened in this one place. So it had to be awe-inspiring in and of itself. And it says... Uh, and they were uh, amazed and astonished, saying, are not these, um, these who are speaking Galileans? Now, here's what we have to say about Galilee. I'm, I'm going to say this in a way that does not upset my wife, because I mentioned this earlier um, in, in small group this week, and I said deep south, and she took offense to that because she's from Louisiana. So I, I'm going to have to backtrack just a little bit. Uh, and so, and, and, and I'm a redneck from Kansas, so uh, I, I'm, I'm just going to say Galilee was the flyover version of the United States. And you had the coast, you had the elitists, you had all the, the hobnobbers and so on like that. Galilee was one of those areas that you just didn't expect anything to go, be good to come from there. Here's the funny thing. They were from Galilee, but they had a speech impediment as a people. And they couldn't say gut, uh, guttural sounds, so it was like gooly. You know, they couldn't say Galilee, where they were even from. So that's what they were kind of expecting. Aren't these just normal people? Why is the extraordinarily, uh, extraordinary happen with them? And then it goes on in verse 8, it says, And, and how is it that we each, uh, that we hear each of us in our own native language? Now, here's one of the things that we love to do with the Bible. We love to talk about that which we do not know. So if there's, I think that's why we're so drawn to end times many times, is, is, is we want to talk about that which we can't really put our finger on. And we love to imagine. And the day of Pentecost is, is one of those because we're really not sure how it happened, what it looked like. Now, here's something to consider. There were three main languages. There was, there was Latin, that was the government language. There was Greek, uh, that was the marketplace language. And there Aramaic, and Aramaic would have been the, the local language of Jerusalem, each of those would have had their dialects. They would have had within those regional dialects that, that made sense in, in a particular region. Let me give you an example here in the United States. I'm from middle America, where I think we talk normal. <laughs> and, and we say things right. So therefore, um, it's pop. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? It is pop. It is not soda, as my kids who have grown up in New Mexico call it, and, and those from the South who call it Coke, it is pop. You see, we have regional dialects that end up happening, uh, and we can somewhat understand that. But here, they had their regional dialects. There were probably people from dozens of nations and regions throughout, um, throughout the known world, but each heard in his own native language. 
Some have suggested that there were as many as 70 languages that would have been represented in Jerusalem at that particular time. So here's one of the things that I would like to say that I can say with reasonable certainty, the outpouring, outpouring of the Holy Spirit allowed each hearer to understand clearly in his or her own language. And I don't know how God did this, but there are certain things about God that I can't explain. And the fact that there are certain things about God that I can't explain makes him God. And so I'm just going to let God be God on this one. But it, it caused some confusion and it caused some bewilderment and amazement. And actually some of them were saying, I think they're drunk. And so Peter has a, a good explanation. And now we're getting into the time of the sermon. So let's look at this. It says, but Peter standing with the 11 lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words, for these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. Uh, basically, this is what he's saying. It's only nine o'clock. <laughs> they haven't had time to get drunk. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. I actually like that name. We have a, a son named Joel. And this is what he says. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and uh, your old men shall dream dreams, even uh, on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy, and I will show uh, wonders in the heavens above and signs of the earth below, blood and fire and vapor and smoke, and the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now let me tell you what Peter is doing here. He is, he is connecting dots. Peter connected the current outpouring of the Holy Spirit with the past. He goes back to Joel chapter 2 and says, this is what God said is going to happen. And so he takes what is happening now, he connects it with the past, and he basically says, this should not surprise us. And what's going on right here is very clear because this is what God said is going to happen all along. This day where there's mighty things that are happening and awesome things that are happening, this is what God said several hundred years ago would, in fact, happen. In fact, consider yourselves to be blessed because you are seeing this in your midst, the great and awesome thing that God is doing by pouring out his spirit into this world that it will come upon people and then dwell inside of them and live inside of them. And as it talks about in the book of John, that spirit is a teacher and a guide and a counselor to help us live the walk with Jesus that Jesus desires for us to have. So we connect the, 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 the outpouring of the Holy Spirit with that which happens in the past. But I want you to notice as he goes on, this is what he says. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. And so he, he, he draws back to the miracles of Jesus. And here's one of the things that, that Peter gives us a clue about the fame and the spread of, of Jesus' name during Jesus' ministry. It was well known. It was a well-known fact that Jesus worked miracles, that he healed people, that he made the lame walk, that he gave sight to the blind, that Jesus was able to do these things through the power of God, and that he did them in their midst. So this is not a surprise to them. And then he goes on to say, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed. Man, this is tough because seven weeks before, these were the people, the same people who were yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And so he's saying, listen, you y'all did this. You crucified and, and, and killed by, by the hands of lawless men. And then he goes on to say, God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And it 
is death. Now, what Peter does real quick is he, he tells the story of Jesus. In, in a very quick summary, and I think we have summary, I, I think this sermon was probably much longer than this. I, I, I believe what Peter does here is he tells the story of Jesus. And here's one of the things that we have to understand. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection was and is the central message of the church. Once our message deviates from this right here, we really cease to be doing the will of God for the church. Our message has to be Jesus. It can't be Jesus plus politics. It can't be Jesus plus, plus good works. It, it can't be Jesus plus other religions. It has to be Jesus. That has to be the message of the church. And that was the message uh, of Peter in the beginning. And that needs to be our message today. Because, and I'm gonna tell you something that I have learned through the years, that we can do sermons on, on a lot of, uh, of kind of life issues and we can help people be better. But the times that I have seen conversions and baptisms and decisions for Jesus have been when we have spent time just preaching Jesus. There's power and transformation in the name of Jesus and the early church got that. Let's go ahead and read on in verse 25. In verse 25, it says, For David um, says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is, my, is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh was also will, will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your holy ones see corruption. This is resurrection talk right here. You have made known to me paths of life, and, and you will make me full of gladness with your presence. And so here again, Peter goes in to, to preach a little bit. He's, he's read God's word, and he's making comment, and he says this, Brothers, I, I may say to you with confidence about our patriarch David that he, was both, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. In other words, he's basically saying, he's probably pointing at this point in time. He says, brothers and sisters, I want you to know, David died, and David's buried, and his tomb is right over there. And if you want to go dig up the bones, we can do that right now. And that's a pretty, pretty powerful statement. But then he goes on to say this, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would, uh, he would set one of his descendants on his throne. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ that, was, uh, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. And so again, Peter connected the present day resurrection of Jesus with the past. He was able to go back into the Psalms and say, listen, David spoke about this moment right here, right here, right now. David spoke uh, about this and, and Jesus, when he was speaking with his, uh, his followers after his resurrection said, listen, uh, did I not tell you that all that was written in, in, in the law and in the prophets and in the Psalms would come to be. So he was pointing to this right here. And here's the amazing thing that happened during Peter's very, very first sermon in the church. And as he is talking about the resurrection of Jesus, this is uh, 40 some days after the resurrection of Jesus, not once did somebody say, well, let's go over to the tomb and let's look for Jesus' bones. Let's look for Jesus' body. He, was, he offered that for David, but no, one's, no one objected over the resurrection. It had already become so very well known in that time and in, in that particular culture. So he connected the, the resurrection of Jesus with the past, but he didn't just connect the resurrection. Let's go ahead and, and read on, and starting with verse 32. It says, this Jesus God raised up, and that we are all witnesses. And again, this is, this is common knowledge. Everybody is in agreement of this. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out 
um, this uh, that, that you are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but himself said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my, at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So again, Peter connected the ascension and the glorification of Jesus to the past. He said, we can go back and read about this right here. David talked about this right here. And that's so very, very important. And then we get to verse 36. And in verse 36, uh, Peter preaches these words, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. I, I love this statement here, and I want to clear up a, a theological issue that is often proclaimed by Christians that is a mistake. It says here that God made Jesus both Lord and Christ. Lord is a, a Greek term to mean master, and Christ is a Hebrew term to refer to king, and it says that God made him both Lord and king, or master and and king, and, and this is one of the things I, I have heard people say as they give their testimonies, as they give their testimonies, they often say things like this, and that is when, on that day, at that moment, that I made Jesus Lord and Savior of my life. And this is one of the things I want to let you know, you cannot make Jesus Lord or Christ in your life. You cannot make him master or king. That's not our sphere. Unless we are God the Father, we cannot make Jesus anything. We cannot make him Lord. We cannot make him king. We cannot make him master. We can only respond to him. In other words, I can respond to Jesus and say yes to him as my ruler and my king. And I can acknowledge that he is ruler and king. I can receive him as ruler and king. I can be baptized into him as ruler and king. And I can submit to him as ruler and king. But I cannot make him anything. That is what God did. Jesus has been made by his father, master and king. And we can only respond to that. And Peter's sermon here did not make him master and king. Peter is using his sermon to prove to them that this is, in fact, who Jesus is. And so let's look at it this way. This is Peter's bottom line. And his bottom line is this, that Jesus is master and king. Master and ruler of everything. And we can't make him this. We can only respond to him in this way. In fact, Jim next Sunday is, is actually going to unload on and really kind of unpack what it means to respond to Jesus. And, and, and so what I'd like to do here today is I'm going to kind of hit a few of, uh, of the high points of how they responded to Jesus. And so one of the things we find here is Peter is done preaching. And as he is done preaching, he says this. Now when they, or it's, Luke says this, he says, now when they had heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Now, when you come to realization of who Jesus is, and that is one of those things that penetrates your heart, it mandates a response. It mandates some kind of response. And here's one of the things that I, I want you to notice. This, this is important. There is no altar call in the first sermon that was preached in the church. There was no, let's sing this verse one more time because I know that there are people that need to come forward. There was no emotional plea. There was no altar call. There was no invitation hymn. There were people who heard the message and knew that in some way they had to respond to Jesus. And so when we come to the realization of who Jesus is and what he did, we, cannot, we, we can't help but 
respond in some way. And so they are cut to the heart and they just say, what do we need to do? We believe this. In, in a matter of speaking, they were confessing with their mouth and they believed in their heart and they said, what do we do now? And Peter says these words. I grew up hearing these words time and time and time again. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when it says repent here, I love what it says in, in the Message Bible. Change your life and turn to God and be baptized. And so really what, what Peter is, is telling those who are, are wanting to, to enter into the life of the church, change your life, turn to God, and be baptized. And, and one of the things that I think is so vitally important for us to understand is baptism is the response to Jesus in the book of Acts. As you read through the book of Acts, and, and I, I'm just gonna unpack this here for you real quick. What we call the sinner's prayer is about 150 to 200 years old max. But what we find the early church doing is saying yes to Jesus and just entering into the waters of baptism. And at some time throughout this series, we're gonna really kind of dive into what baptism is and what it is not, but it is the response to Jesus. And some of y'all may have never responded to Jesus in this way, and we would love to talk with you about this. And here's the cool thing. I wanna to go to verse 41. Verse 41 says this, so those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So I actually heard a, a guy preach this a, a few years ago and he made this point. He said on that day, thousands heard and 3,000 heard. Now you get that? That thousands heard but 3,000 heard. In other words, there were 3,000 that internalized the message and did something with it. And, and I think, you think about the church today, and I think about myself, how many times do I sit down with the Bible and, and I journal and I read and I study and I get up and I go about my life as if I didn't encounter God's word at all? And how many times do we come to church in times like this, and we hear God's word, and we say, amen, and I love that, and you're taking notes in your Bible, and, and you're saying, this is great stuff right here, and then you walk out of the doors, and you do nothing with it. You see, the tragedy is that there were thousands who heard and did nothing with it, but there were some who were cut to the heart and said, I gotta do something. And so I don't know where you are here today. I hope and I pray that you're not just one of those who heard, but one of those who really heard God's word. Will you join me in prayer? Father, I thank you that you have given us ears to hear. My prayer is that as we hear your word, we are radically transformed, that there are decisions made, that we respond in some way to say yes to Jesus, maybe yes to Jesus for the very first time, or maybe yes to Jesus just for today for the first time in a long time. Thank you. And I pray that we do become true hearers of your word. Thank you in Jesus' name, amen.